Thanks for that lovely MC job. Switch this on. Everyone can hear me better now? Is that working? It is wonderful. There we go. So thanks, you all, for coming out. This is quite a crowd for the second Backbone Conf. And uh, it should be fun. It was a lot of fun last year. And I think someone took away the uh, dongle. Do you still have it? Did you take it back? No. Oh, there it is. Sorry. And we're off to the races. So um, welcome again. And uh, it's too bad we're doing this conference indoors because it's gorgeous, gorgeous weather in Boston um, out yesterday and today. I've been assured that it's always like this all summer long. And it's making me miss uh, being in the States. So I have been uh, mostly unemployed and uh, or gainfully unemployed, I'd like to say. And uh, roaming around this year, so there'll be some pictures in some of the slides. Um, so last year's Backbone Conference was uh, a lot of fun. And um, here, actually, let me just tweak this for a moment. Sorry. So, sorry about that. My, uh, my laptop was, uh, along with everything else, most of my worldly possessions was actually ripped off in uh, Italy about a month ago. So I'm still getting to uh, grips with uh, getting the setup back on uh, this new Italian laptop, which has the keyboard that's all funny, so all the characters makes it difficult to type. Everything can get mapped mostly to American, except for the little tilde that you need to get to your home directory, which is down by your lower pinky. So that really <coughs> screws things up, um, as does keynote uh, configuration. But um, Last year was sort of a really kind of, I think, uh, a feel-good conference. There was a bunch of folks from a bunch of different frameworks around, and a lot of great discussion happened both in the sessions and outside of the sessions on sort of techniques and tips for uh, doing complicated applications. So I think that as a group, most of the folks here, you know, are uh, building websites that have grown beyond, you know, what a website traditionally was, and you start to do things with more and more JavaScript, and you start to wrestle with some of the difficulties that can arise when trying to make something that works really well, that doesn't feel janky or, uh, you know, or flickery or cluttery um, for people to use it when you're trying to make a sort of responsive application. Maybe, maybe, you know, we've gotten beyond the days when we're just trying to mimic the feel of a native app anymore. It doesn't have to feel like an OS X app or an iPhone or Android app um, on the web. But you do want to have it have its own sort of paradigm that doesn't feel um, too too fusty. So there's lots of good tips and tricks and techniques for trying to make that happen, and uh, and sharing it I think is what this conference is about. And I hope that you know beyond just the talks and sort of the, you know the things that we have to say from our experiences that there's a whole wealth of experience. You know, one of the strange things about seeing a little. Um, library like Backbone, which is not very much coded in of itself, grow up and be used in so many different use cases, you know, see be used in uh, web applications, sort of magazines, newspaper interactive graphics, inside of games, um, inside of native applications on mobile tablets, is that my own personal experience with the framework and what I have used it for is this tiny, tiny fraction of the realm and scope of what other people have done with it in terms of you know, sharing models in the client and the server, integrating with, with native controls, using it for situations like, uh, like an interactive magazine where you're flipping pages that are very different than what I've done. So getting folks to share their experiences and the things that they've learned, I think, is one of the more important things that can come out of this. So what is the problem that, uh, that Backbone uh, addresses? Like, you know, why wouldn't you just use server-side rendered HTML and call it a day and go from there and uh, do everything 2005 style? Um, so I think that where this comes from is um, a lot of us have experience starting with an application that uh, is mostly sort of, you start with data that's in the HTML page and you move beyond that to sticking JSON back down into your page and then using JavaScript to look at your data and manipulate the page interactively as you um, sort of have the user interact with the rich controls on the page. So what I mean by that is you have your, you know, you have all your jQuery handlers. You have this big, you know, window.data object, and you kind of look into it and uh, push and pull pieces out, and update the page, update your global data object, and then save that back down to the server. And if you do this for a long time, you get more sophisticated. Maybe you start to have a sense of different parts of your application or different views, 
Um, but things can quickly become sort of tangled and, uh, and messy. And backbone is, is, the whole point of it is sort of to be a minimal extraction of if I run into these problems, what are the common, you know, 90% solutions that, that apply to all of these cases that I can pull out? So the basic one is just separating your UI from your business logic, your interface from your model. And that's the fundamental thing that sort of clears up and solves a lot of the, uh, the complexities with working on a big app. But all of like, the little sort of features and functions in Backbone are basically um, things that prove useful you know, time and time again when you're running into this issue of trying to keep your, your application sane. So beyond just uh, trying to address the problem, there's a particular sort of type of, I think, maybe style that, uh, that Backbone accomplishes, right? There's gonna be a million different ways to try to tackle this problem. If the problem is complexity in large JavaScript applications. You can address it you know, head on in many different ways. You can um, you know, try to have a more all-consuming, you know, all-encompassing um, framework that sort of knows everything about your data and then, and then constrains it in a very sort of you know, hierarchical way. Um, where you have sort of rules set up for how each little bit is supposed to behave, um, and and there's and there's probably you know it's probably a functional style you could adopt for dealing with this problem. There's probably uh, a constraint-driven style you could adopt. The backbone style is uh, sort of basically simple object orientation, saying we're not just going to have when you get back data from the server as an AJ as JSON, the JSON is just data. It's not objects yet. Um, it doesn't have any behavior associated with it. So the backbone sort of way to do things is to take very, very simple object-oriented concepts um, and, uh, and to try to find sort of the minimal set of these data structuring concepts in terms of the UI that make it easy to work with an application. So what that means is models and collections for your data and views and URLs for your interface. And those are kinds of the primitives that you're working with. That, that if you have rich primitives, then uh, it'll be a little bit easier to build your application. So what we're doing is we're looking for features that sort of fit that style, and, uh, and that's how the framework uh, grows and changes. Um, and part of it is that it makes it having this nice, first of all, you know, JavaScript is kind of a nice, simple object-oriented language. Um, and having your application being written in a simple object-oriented style where you've got these rich models that you can have methods on that do useful work for you and you can reason about it, you can say, you know, account dot disable or you know book dot chapters dot first, you know, or uh, user dot photos dot favorite dot share with other user. Right, having these these, these uh, objects that have their data with them. The user has the photos, and the photos are composed of data that tells you where the file is and all this other stuff, and who it's been shared with, and what the data is. And having that not just as raw JSON, but coupled with simple behavior that you could pass around in your application. So everywhere that the photo is being referenced in your application, everywhere, every piece of code that has to deal with the photo is able, if it needs to, to share it with another user, or is able, if it needs to, to get the public URL for that photo, um, makes it much easier to work with. Then, then, again, if you go back, if you contrast the style, right? Imagine if you had written the sharing functionality for a photo as the jQuery callback when, when you click the share button next to the photo. Right? If that had been where the logic goes for sharing the photo, which is what you may have done in the past, you say, oh, we have a share button, that's where I'm going to put that. Now, nowhere else in your app is able to do that. You have to, you know, sometimes there's crazy, you, you may have worked before on apps in the past where you sort of simulate clicks on things to, from other places to pretend like it's doing that action. You say, oh, I wrote the handler for sharing over there. I'm going to fake a click on it, and that'll do the thing I needed to do. And then, of course, once your UI changes, you're kind of up shit creek at that point. Um, so that's that's a little bit on the basic style of Backbone. And then the other thing that's not really so much the style, but kind of like the golden, the golden uh, mountain that, uh, that everyone uh, tries to aim for a little bit, but is not necessarily natural, is this notion of statelessness. So there's a few different things that can make working on a web application difficult. One of them is code structure, right? So we all talk about spaghetti code, um, where everything's tangled together, and in such a way, especially in terms of, uh, of a front-end um, application, a client-side application, where you have a lot of logic and things that your code needs to know how to do, and a lot of interface stuff that's just specific to how the design works and how the layout is, and when you open this panel, these things need to appear. And if those get tangled together in spaghetti style, then that makes it extremely difficult um, to change, first of all, but more importantly, to change your interface. So usually, in you know these web applications, your 
business logic is going to live a lot longer than your interfaces. You're going to have these core features that your app's going to be able to do, and you might go through a number of different designs, um, or you might want to be able to add new, new features, new interfaces. Um, you might want to make a mobile version of it using the same core business logic. <coughs> um, and if they're tangled together, all of that becomes incredibly difficult. And it's hard because the easy thing to do is to tangle it together. If you're not really thinking about what you're doing, then um, you know every time you have an event come in, every time the user drags to make the connection or clicks on the thing, the natural thing to do is to do the manipulation of that data right in the handler, and that you know ties it very concretely to uh, to what the structure of your DOM is, to what the structure of your HTML is, and then when you want to change that, it becomes difficult. So that's that's one way that that code can become. Complicated, but simple sort of good refact, good factoring of your code into you know into views and models can help that. But state is another different way, right? You can have spaghetti code, but you can also have spaghetti state. Um, and what I mean by that is, and it's a little bit harder to think about. But what I mean by that is that if the state of your application is in a place where it matters, it matters what the state is and where you can go from there. And different pieces of your application depend on the state being set up in a certain way in a different place of your application for them to work. Um, then it becomes very, very difficult to refactor your application. Also, and what I mean by this is things where you have a value, you have you know the the name of the person or the number of users they've shared with or the list of their associated models, and if that state, you know, it, different pieces of your interface rely on that state to render and to do their thing, and if um, those, if first of all, if that state is duplicated into more than one place, and different pieces of your interface start having different ideas about what the truth of the system is, different pieces of your interface start thinking that you know have, having different copies of that state and beginning to need to coordinate to agree on what the truth is, to agree on what the number of friends is, to agree on what the name of the of the title is. Um, that's one way that the state starts to get tangled together, and you have to spend a lot of time and effort making sure that everything works together. The other way is that if you end up with sort of a big state machine where your application can be doing this one thing over here or doing this one thing over here, and you can transition between the two, but you can't do more than one thing at the same time, is another way where you have a lot of state. Um, and you have to be careful not to paint yourself into a corner where all of a sudden you're over in this mode, but you need to be able to do this feature that only exists in this other mode, and the two can't work together because they have different sort of requirements about their system. So the ideal. Not, not necessarily the ideal thing, but the style that, that Backbone tries to encourage is this idea of statelessness, where if instead you basically treat your state as flat, saying I have all of my models, I have all of my data, and the view renders um, sort of transparently off of that, regardless of whatever the configuration of the data in the models is, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be in any combination. There's no invalid, invalid transition that I have there. The view just sort of has a single step, a very flat, um, rendering off of that. So instead of a state machine where you've got mutually um, exclusive states that can't both happen at the same time and that might have a few steps between them to get from one to the other, instead of that you have uh, a flat state where any combination of data can exist at the same time and your UI just reflects what the state of the data is. So it means that maybe you have things that aren't exposed, like if you're in tab number two, all the stuff in, in tab number one um, you can't click on it because there's no way to click on it. But it's nice if it doesn't break because of that. It's nice if those functions still continue to function and uh, and they don't all get broken simply because the HTML isn't there at the moment. If it's basically stateless off the state of the data. Um, so I have one little example um, from Document Cloud, which is we have uh, some drop-down menus um, that are sensitive to the state of what the documents that are being selected are. So if you've just got one document selected, they have to be written in singular. You've got more than one that got to be written in plural. If you've selected documents that um, you don't have permission to edit, then the stuff, the editing controls in the menus have to be disabled. Um, you know, if you've got ones that are public, then you should be allowed to publish them, and these kinds of things. So it matters both the number of documents you have selected and which documents you have selected and what their relationship is to you to determine what the valid um, state of the menu is. So you could imagine this being a very difficult thing to do. You could imagine this saying like, all right, every time this selection changes, which is already sort of a nice concept to have the notion of when the selection changes and not having to sort of loop through and count and see what's being selected and what's not selected. But you can imagine like having to reinitialize a jQuery context menu plugin basically and like blow it away and then make a new one every time that this thing changes. Um, but it's nicer and, and having to sort of reconfigure it for the, for the situation at hand. 
But it's nice if you can sort of let it be stateless and say, all right, the context menus are going to listen for changes in the selection state. And they're simply going to re-render their, their menu contents um, as the selection changes. And then you don't have to worry about, the, about ever having an invalid option in the context menu. Because whatever it is, it's simply reflecting the state transparently of what's going on in the models. So that's one thing that you could do is sort of a state machine thing saying, you know, if you know, one document that I do not have permission to edit is selected, then go to this state over here. Or you could have it be kind of stateless, where regardless of what's selected, it doesn't matter. They just reflect that in their uh, rendering. So with those as a notion, sort of the, the aesthetics of backbone and, and the statelessness idea, what I wanted to talk to you about today mostly is some of my favorite um, backbone patterns. Um, things that aren't necessarily used all the time um, and don't need to be used all the time, but might be helpful given a certain situation. So to give you an idea of what some of these are, um, the first one is just custom methods. Um, sometimes you see people treat uh, backbone models as, uh, as basically just their JSON um, representation, basically saying, all right, this is an object that's encapsulating this bit of JSON, and I can listen for events, and I'm not going to add anything else. Like, I'm going to leave my models totally um, naked. And I think that is foolish, because they're a great place to put all kinds of uh, useful utility methods that pertain specifically to that data. So again, it's just sort of object orientation. You've got this specific data represents an entity in your system, and there's going to be lots of useful functionality um, that goes along with that data. And if you put that on your model, then all of a sudden, everything that has a reference to that model can do all of those features that you need um, for your app to work. So your app can become much more you know, um, easy to, to, to tie together. You can share these things from any place where the reference exists. You can delete them or edit them. Um, or get their attributes. So you can disable the account, you can share a book with a friend, you can get the public, you know, the large version of the public URL for a, for a photo, for example. So atomic pieces of data with their, with their shared behavior. Um, and so this is, you know, this is where it goes, right? So whenever you see your first um, extension of when you're creating a new backbone model, instead of leaving that object empty, you know, fill in all the properties with, uh, with your favorite functions. So if you read the public URL, Right? We're looking at, at the URL of the photo here and then, and then generating the correct um, URL for the, for the large one. Or if we're looking at the sharing with example, um, right here we've got a, uh, a, uh, an object that has, that has sort of an associated uh, sharings collection. So if we're going to have a book here and you want to share the book, or a user here, and you want to share the, uh, a user's book and you want to share it with a friend, you can get the ID off of the book. Um, you can look back to the owner to get the, uh, the owner's ID off of the user, and you can go to the friend and get the friend's ID and create that sort of join table and then send that to the server. So this is something that you might otherwise put not on the model. You might put it in the, uh, again, sort of in the handler, in the controller for whatever is, whatever is doing the, the button that does the sharing in the application. You might say, oh, back one already provides you know, this create function. I'll just pass in the IDs there. But it's nice if this is a thing, right? If this is a concept in your application that you might share a book with somebody else to put that in the model and to uh, be able to access that from anywhere. So that's custom model functions. Um, custom collection functions. Backbone already comes with a whole bunch of, of uh, underscore functions on, uh, on collections. You can map and filter and reduce them and, uh, and, and do all of these kinds of count by, group by, sort by, all these kinds of aggregate operations on them. But it's nice if you've got your own ones that you tend to do all of the time in your application to define those as methods on your collection and to have them you know, be available to be used from everywhere. So for example, I'm a user and I've got a friend's collection on me. But, um, or there's another user and I've got a it's got a friend's collection. I want to find out which friends are in common with myself. So that's just an intersection of the two friends, right? Um, but if you define that as a nice method on your collection, then it becomes very easy to do this sort of thing. Or fuzzy searching, right? So if you want to do a simple search, that one's already got filtering for that. But if you want to, if you have a nice little algorithm for doing a fuzzy regex sort of match on uh, on a string to look it up by name, stick that on your collection, and then you can use it uh, from everywhere. So here's the in common definition, where you take the intersection of uh, the models on this collection along with the intersection of the uh, of the user that you pass in, which is another model. Their friends is a collection, and you take those models and you do it together, and you find out the ones that are that are in common. Um, another nice pattern beyond that is filtered collections. So frequently, um, you start, at least in Backbone, sort of root level collections that, that map to the server-side notion of what the table is for the, for the resources. 
So you know, if I've got accounts on the server side, I'm going to have an accounts collection on the client side, and there's going to be a whole bunch of different kinds of accounts in there. Maybe everything in the organization um, that's currently being looked at by the user, right? So you'll have admins, and you'll have um, colleagues, and you'll have guests, and you'll have you know friends, and these kinds of things. Um, and then when you want to iterate through them or use them, you kind of want more granularity than just the single sort of global one. So some examples of that are you know, all the published documents, all of the articles after a certain date, all of the posts in reverse chronological order um, as sort of filters on the, on the collection. So an implementation for something like that could be defining your after function, you give it a date, and then you just use the underscore um, filter function to loop through all of the uh, all of the posts and uh, look up only the posts where the where the date is later than the date you pass in. Um, and then this just gives you back a new array of posts that match your criteria. You can use that from anywhere and you're off to the races. Um, and there, there's another way of doing this. So this so this is there's kind of different styles, right? So one way of, do, of filtering your collections is to define a bunch of useful filter functions that return an array of the values that you need and then you can just filter it whenever you need to. Another way to do it is to actually, um, it's sort of an older trick, but to create a new collection that listens to the original collection and tracks um, what happens in it, but with the difference that it filters out only the things it's interested in, in paying attention to before it does so. So basically, we have a source collection here, and we're going to listen to all the events on it. And whenever we have an add event or a remove event, we're going to see if we care about this model. So if this um, post is after the date, or if this user is one of my friends, or if the photo is public, or whatever your, whatever your matching condition might be. And then we just proxy that, um, that action through. So basically, whenever we hear that the source collection has added a new model, we're going to add it if it matches our condition, or we're going to remove it if it matches our condition. And now you have this other collection you can work with and pass around that tracks the source, um, but only contains the things you care about. So that's kind of a nice one. Um, harmonizing with GC is, uh, is a nice uh, backbone pattern. Um, so. Thinking about how to work with references in an object-oriented language like JavaScript is, uh, it's sort of, you know, OOP programming 101 and thinking about how your references are structured, but it's not really JavaScript programming 101. So traditionally, with JavaScript, um, you know, in the past it's been used in context where you don't have to worry about references because you're going to load the page for a short amount of time, maybe five minutes, and not do that many things in your, in your click handlers. And then when the page gets closed, you know, all of your garbage gets closed. The page, all, everything on the page is going to be gone. You don't have to worry about it. With an application that you want for people to be able to leave it open for weeks, you want people to be able to you know, leave it running in their computer all the time and never have to, never have to log out of it. Um, I almost just spilled the water all over everything. The uh, learning how to harmonize with GC is really critical. So, um, so the basic idea is of course, with, uh, with JavaScript and, and garbage collections, you're going to have references between your objects, um, everything that lives in JavaScript land, everything that exists in the DOM. And whenever something stops being referenced by your code, it will get cleaned up by the computer. Um, and sometimes this leads you sort of you know, beginning programmers to, to get very paranoid about uh, cleaning up references and to like, use the delete operator on every, every variable that they're done with which you don't need to do, of course. It, all you need to do is just stop stop referring to it, and it'll get, it'll get cleaned up. Um, and then in Backbone, this takes a particular um, sort of interest, because you have these models and you have these views, and you're going to have a certain amount of references between the two. You can have, of course, as many as you'd like. You can, you can put pointers everywhere, right? You can say, if you're going to be extreme about using a lot of references, you can say, I'm going to have an explicit view hierarchy. I'm going to have my root view. My root view is going to know about all of its children. All of them are going to know about all their children. I can walk the entire tree of views that represent my application and have references to everything. And the same goes for the models, right? You have your root collections of models. You can walk through all of the models and all their children, all their children's collection. Um, and, uh, and you can keep track of the ways that they're linked. You can say, when a view um, is rendering a model, it's going to, uh, to have a reference. You, know, you can say, this dot model to get back at the model. And you can do the other thing as well. You can have a model say, this dot you know, uh, let's see, book dot, uh, dot chapter views, and then have the model have references out to all of its views. So normally that's fine. You just have to pay attention when you're deleting stuff to remove the references that you no longer need, or else the objects are going to stay around. Um, so it, with events, this gets a little bit more interesting, because an event is a reference. So when 
you um, say on on change of the title, you know, view dot update. That that function that closure has a reference to the view, right? It's able to change the view and being added as the event is basically the model saying, I'm going to call this function whenever the event runs. So now the model has a reference to that view that it's going to use every time that change happens. And if you delete the view without remembering to clean up that reference, it's still going to be there. And GC is still not going to be able to actually remove the view. And you're still going to be calling it um, whenever, that, whenever that change happens. Um, so the way to deal with this is, first of all, um, to not use references you don't need to. Right, so the easiest thing to do is to is to uh, if you avoid having everything know about everything else, then you have less GC problems because um, chunks can be collected all together because there's simply nothing referring to it anymore, um, and especially pieces that don't need to know. So, for example, you often have models and views that that are very tightly you know woven. You have uh, you know they basically represent each other and they and they live and die at the same time. I have a page of search results. I get all of these new items in for my search results. All of their little views are coming in. And then when I click to the next page of search results, that previous page is gone. All of those models are gone, and their views are gone. So even though they've been tightly coupled with events and they're listening very closely, it doesn't matter because, because nothing else is, because it's not total, and it's not a complete tree. All of that stuff can be garbage collected all at once, and I don't have to even think about it or unbind anything myself. Um, actually, let's go through this a little bit. So. Examples of this are, um, of course, when you uh, when you add a new when you add a new uh, result, like I was just saying, make a new result view there, and then append it to the DOM, um, or when you have an initialized function that, uh, that that renders it when you're changing. So these are both cases of having sort of the view have a reference back to the model, and uh, and if they if they get thrown away at the same time, then it all just gets garbage collected at the same time. But if the life cycles are different then you have to think about it a little bit more. So if the life cycles are different, then you're either going to have to clean it up yourself um, and say, all right, now I've gotten rid of this thing that's going away before the other thing that's pointing to it is. So I have to sever that connection so that things can be garbage collected. Um, or you uh, can use a backbone feature that was introduced uh, somewhat recently called listen to, which is a way of inverting that pointer. So instead of, instead of the thing where the event is being sent from, having the reference to the thing that's listening, it basically says the reference is going to go the other way, and the thing that's listening is going to have the reference to the thing that is sending the event. And the reason why you might want to do this is because of the different levels of change. So if something um, is sort of ephemeral, it's not lasting as long as its parent is, then that's the thing that should be listening. The stuff that's in your app that lasts the longest and is around forever and, uh, and emits events and that everyone cares about is the stuff that should not be um, pointing out to anyone else because then you have to keep on deleting those pointers all the time. It's the stuff that's ephemeral and that turns over very quickly and that gets deleted a lot that should be listening to the things that are more permanent. So if you do it that way, um, then you can sort of automatically sever all the connections, right? With listen to, when the view gets removed, it can say, I'm going to delete everything because I'm being removed right now, I'm going to delete everything that I'm pointing at. And so when you have that ephemeral view that goes away at the top, everything that's pointing at down below can sever it all at once, and you don't have to uh, have to manually worry about it too much. So that's uh, that's that's some ways to, to harmonize with GC. I think I put it in that order. So if you can get away with it, you know, don't have the reference in the first place, and uh, and then it's not a problem because there's nothing to keep it around. Or if you are going to have the reference, then be aware of which piece, which side of the reference is going to last um, shorter or longer, and and have the thing that lasts a short amount of time listen to the thing that lasts for a longer amount of time. Another fun pattern is uh, lazy loading. So the problem here is that you have a large collection of, uh, of data on your, on your application. You don't want to load it all at once necessarily. But when the app asks for an item, you should either transparently return it directly to the thing that asked for it, or you should go to the server, fetch it down, uh, cache it locally, and then uh, return it. Um, and normally this is hard in JavaScript, right, because we're not blocking. So if I give it to you directly, then there's no way to have a consistent API where I either give it to you directly or I go to the server and then you have a callback where I give it to you later on, um, unless you use something like, uh, like a promise or like a, or like a deferred. So, so basically, this, is what I'm, this lookup method here is lazy. So if the user's collection has that user by ID, it'll just call this immediately and I'll get it in uh, my callback will execute you know, basically synchronously. Or if it has to go to the server, then it's going to come back. And so you implement this in your application by saying I'm going to have a lookup function 
Um, I'm going to give it an ID. I'm going to try to get it out of the local collection. And if it exists, then I'm going to create a new deferred to return and resolve it before I even return it and then send that back down. Um, and the function will run immediately. Otherwise, I'm going to go fetch it from the uh, server and return that also, you know, model.fetch returns the deferred object for that, for that fetch, which will then get, as soon as the server sends back the model, that will be resolved. And now you have that interface where you can always just use this and you don't have to care about whether it's um, local or remote. So that's kind of a fun pattern to avoid, to avoid the if I have it in my cache, else pattern. And you can just mix something like that into even, you know, into your base collection if you're doing this a lot and then use it all over the place. Um, another uh, good uh, backbone pattern is thinking about relations on the server side in your uh, relational database, or maybe your maybe your non-relational database, but that still has relations of some sort in it, um, and the objects on the client side in the in the browser. So, one of the problems here, or one of the really difficult things here, is that in a server side MVC framework, it's pretty easy to have the notion of your objects that you're working with, your domain objects mapping one-to-one -to, -one to your database um, structure because you have access to the entire database on the on the server and you basically you can and on the client you can't right you can't really pretend like you have access to the entire database um, at your fingertips because you don't right you can do particular queries for little pieces of data from the database um, but you can't really map it one-to-one -one onto the client all of the relations and all of their size and uh, and complexity or maybe you can but it's not terribly wise to uh, to sort of bring that bulk of data down to the client side. Um, so things are very concrete on the server side, but you can be a little bit more creative with your modeling on the client side. So if we have something sort of complex, like a, uh, not that complex, but a many-to-many, -many, right? So a user has many friends through friendships, and you can have many users having many friends. It's not really belongs to, it's a many-to-many. -many. Um, on the client side, there's a few different ways you can sort of model this. So um, one way to do it is with your uh, sort of slightly more server style with your global um, friendships join table, right? So friendships here is uh, is a collection, and you're going to load in basically all of the all of the joins, all of the from user and to user links that make up the the friend connection here. And so if you want to find out, you know, who are the friends of this user, you're going to say, all right, what who's what's my ID? I'm going to filter through all the friendships. I'm going to look for all the friendships that are coming from me. And I'm going to get back out um, those those uh, those joins there, right? So I don't have access to the friends. I'm going to map through them, and then I'm going to look up the two user from the friendship join table, and I'm going to look up the actual user on the client side, and then return the array of friends. So this is a way of saying, starting from me as a user object, give me back an array of user objects that represent my friends, using this sort of server side style. Um, of, of having the join table live on the client side and then looking at the join table to, to do your join. So that's one way of doing it. And as a brief uh, coffee script aside, um, this is uh, just a quick, nice example. I was, I was writing this and I was like, man, this is really a lot of, uh, of stuff. I mean, and it's also sort of you have to do the two loops um, and, and do the map and the filter. And it's, it's nice that you can just do this in one little, uh, one little thing, right? So here I just have basically a loop that works as a map and a filter and says for every friend in the friendships, when my ID is the same as the from user, so there's your filter right there, um, look up the other user. And then that whole expression is the map. So that's the one way to do it. Um, but then another way to do it is to basically, instead of having this join table, what you do is you send down um, the list of IDs <coughs> along with each user. So when you, when you have in your JSON response, you say, Here's the JSON response for a user. Its friends field is a list of all of the IDs that it's you know saying friends to, and uh, and then when you initialize your model, you look up that array of integers, and you make a new little user collection right on the model itself. So the user model has a user collection of friends, and you uh, and you filter through the users and sort of and sort of say, all right, are you in my list of IDs? Because that's the underscore dot include. Is this user in the list of my friend IDs? You get back that, that uh, array of users. And now instead of having this function that looks at the join table, you have a pre-built collection on the model that you can refer to directly. So I'm not saying that one of these is better than the other, but it's the kind of thing that's nice to think about when you're modeling, um, when you're modeling you know, rich sort of relationships on the server side that need to get translated to the client side. And what's the most convenient way for you to do this in your application? Is it going to be convenient for you to have a join table if it's not too big? Or is it going to be convenient for you to have collections that, uh, that fit with everything that they contain? 
at initialize time. Another uh, good backbone pattern is uh, dealing with timing. So um, one problem you might have is you want to optimize a little piece of UI by not having it be rendered more often than it needs to be, especially for statistics views or roll-up views or aggregate views that are looking at a whole bunch of models and listening for changes, um, and then doing some kind of computation across many models. Um, so that's usually fine, but then all of a sudden, if you have a change that happens to a whole bunch of items, this thing's going to sort of thrash. It's going to be rendered a lot because you have many of these specific changes. Um, and, uh, and you can manually coordinate that, right? You can have some sort of a Boolean flip that says, all right, are we changing? Let me wait until all the changes are done, and then after they're done, um, let's finish, let's do the statistics view again. But instead of manually coordinating it, you can just use a little bit of, uh, you can use sort of the JavaScript event loop to, uh, to your benefit here and, uh, and make it and very easily optimize it. So with something with uh, debounce, which is an underscore function that, uh, that takes a function and says, as long as you keep calling me, I'm not going to run until you stop calling me for a certain amount of time. So it's, it's basically a set timeout under the hood. But, but a set timeout where as long as you keep calling that function, nothing's, it's not going to work until you stop calling it for the specified amount of time and then it runs. And it's great for these kinds of renders, these debounce renders. So I've got my stats view, which is going to get called by everything as all these things change constantly. Um, and it's not actually going to re-render until I stop calling it for you know, 25 milliseconds. So basically instantaneously, but, um, but after all of those changes happen. And because... Uh, because Backbone's changes are by default not debounce, because by default they happen within the current uh, call stack, you know you can basically put you know a zero there or a, or a very small number there and have it and have it work and have it wait until right after all of those calls are being made and then the thing renders. So this is sort of something you can sprinkle throughout your your uh, your code judiciously to say this is happening too much. I want it to to wait until the end of the call stack before it's going to happen again. And then in a uh, similar vein. There's this uh, notion of threaded rendering in JavaScript, which doesn't really make sense because there's no threads. But um, we we know that uh, that when JavaScript runs, it's it the UI of your application can't can't uh, run in parallel. If you're doing a really expensive computation that locks your CPU in JavaScript, or really expensive transformation, your page is going to freeze until you're done with that. Um, this is not really a problem anymore, uh, very much at least, unless you have like a ton of data that that's making your page laggy. But in the IE6, IE7 days, and if you still have to worry about ever targeting Windows XP, IE8, um, and or maybe we should say EG, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's not only a problem, but, um, but uh, it has sort of that very you know, JavaScript heavy feel where you've got this page and it's kind of jerky because it's doing the JavaScript slowly and it's making the UI thread block. Um, so this often happens when you have basically maybe a particular user. So in my case, I'm most familiar with this from uh, from an old startup um, where uh, you know we had a contact uh, application and there was a little contact list in the sidebar of the email. Um, and for most folks, it was fine. We'd render all their contacts when the page loaded. Uh, the CEO of the company had like 6,000 contacts, which was way more than anyone else um, who had been developing the app had. And so when he tried to load his contacts, it would block his entire email for like maybe five or 10 seconds in IE7, right? Or in IE6. Um, so the notion here is you can, you can thread your renders, again, with basically a set timeout. Um, so this is actually a really nice way of keeping it. If you, if you, you know, it's better to optimize. If you can make it fast enough, so you don't have to worry about this. That's ideal. But if it's not fast enough and your rendering is expensive, then this is a way to make it feel less painful by doing it in chunks and letting the HTML redraw in between every chunk. So basically, we say, I'm going to look up my, uh, my models. Um, the ones I'm going to render are just the first 50. I'm going to do it in chunks of 50. So this is underscore dot first gives you the first 50 things. Underscore dot rest 50 gives you all everything else in the list that's after the 50th one. So that's items number 51 through n, where n is however long your list is. And then I'm going to render all the ones in the first 50. And then I'm going to defer. And this is just recursive, right? So so the, on the root case, I'm going to is the items or items. On the root case, I'm looking up all of my models. And then after that point, I'm passing in the list of two defer models into that uh, function. So it's going to recurse down as long as it needs to, rendering the first 50 off the list until the list is empty, at which point it's done. Um, and then it can go on from there. And, uh, and so that doesn't block your UI. And that's kind of a fun pattern. Um, another good one is uh, subclassing models. This is something that people don't always think to do, but can be pretty handy. So if you've got, if you've got a bunch of uh, models in your application that are very disparate and that do 
the, well, they're not, they're not too disparate. They're the same kind of thing, but they behave very differently. So for example, you might have accounts on your system. Some of the accounts actually are real accounts and they own resources and they have edit access. Some of the accounts are guests and they can't do anything. In a document cloud, we have this very different notion of a, uh, an account that is an up, that, you know, it's a journalist, it's an uploader who can upload documents. And you also have a reviewer. And the reviewer can log into the workspace, but they're an, un they're an invited expert from outside. You invite them with their email address. And they can come in and look at a specific set of documents you've set up for them and add notes just on those documents, but have otherwise no ability to do anything because they're not really a member of the system. They're someone that you're inviting in for this particular task. And so those are both a, sort of accounts. Um, they both have emails and they both have logins and passwords, but very, very, very different functionality. Um, or you could imagine different media types, maybe in a media application, photos versus videos versus sounds are all assets. They all have URLs, um, but they behave, they have different behaviors. It's just to subclass your, uh, your models further. So instead of only having your asset backbone model and then having a type field on that, and then you say, if type is photo, do this, um, you can actually, you can say, you know, my account is a backbone model and my publisher is a kind of an account, my reader is a kind of an account, and my guest reader is a kind of a reader, and, uh, and just, you know, go on from there and add, add all the functions that don't apply to the other ones in your, in your subclass. And you can extend it down as far as you like, although going too far is probably not wise either. Um, a new one is uh, global events. This is uh, not new. This is, this is an old one, sometimes called the mediator pattern. I'm not really sure why. But uh, all, all that it really is is uh, realizing that sometimes you have changes in state that affect your entire application. There's a change in state that's really important that you need to know about, like everywhere, um, and that might affect, might affect UI like all across your application. Um, and so in Backbone 1.0, the events, Backbone events is now mixed into the Backbone object. So you can use that just as a convenient place to do global event uh, handling. So what do I mean by this? You usually don't want to use global events unless, unless you really need them, right? So normally if an event, so pe people kind of overuse them with, with the mediator pattern and say that all of my application needs to know about everything. So I'm going to send all of my important events through this global object. Um, but the problem there is the problem like with any global, right? You can have, you can have namespace problems where you know, the change here means something you don't expect it to mean. You can have problems where you want, you want not to have a certain part of the application react to it, but now it's hard not to react because it's set up in this global place and you can't do it with the reference. But there are, there are good use cases also. So for example, imagine that your application has a help mode, and as soon as the user says, I need help, um, all of your different pieces of UI sort of change to become more explanatory and have tool tips and, and balloons that, that explain what the interface is. And then when the help mode goes, goes away, you know, help on, help off, in this case, um, all, all the UI goes back to a sort of functional state. So that's something where you could say all these views are listening to say, is the user asking for help? And when they are, I need to change the way that I render myself. And that would be a place you might want to do it globally. Um, or maybe you're changing the tab. Maybe you have big tabs in your application and many, many pieces of the application need to know when you're switching from the files tab to the email tab. Um, or maybe you have an application where they can stay logged in on the web page, but they can do user switching and go into a different account. And that you know your whole app needs to know when that happens. So this is, you can now just do this on the backbone object if you'd like to, um, instead of having to make your own. Another uh, fun backbone pattern is uh, model snapshots. So we usually think of backbone models as re representing the truth of your application, right? The truth of the state of what the situation is. Basically, what the data is on the server, what the entire system considers to be true. But they don't have to, <coughs> right? You, the models can also be hypotheticals. They can be little uh, parallel universes. You can say, um, or the past, you know? You can have models that, that you can pass through your system and have your system react to and have your system do calculations on that, that represent an if the user did this, you know, what would happen? Or you can uh, have your models represent um, previous states of the system. So you could say, all right, what the models look like five minutes ago or an hour ago? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have those models on the client side. They're not gonna exist in terms of the database on the server, but I can still, you know, put my application into that state by having these models represent different, different uh, modes. So this is just an example of a simple, naive um, undo where I'm basically tracking I'm saying that whenever my model changes, I'm gonna push into this array of changes what its previous state was, its previous attributes. And whenever I want to undo, all I have to do is you know, grab, first of all, I'm gonna save what the state was that I'm undoing, and then I'm gonna set on the model the, the last change that I pushed in, and I can just undo from there. And then when I, when I wanna redo, I'm gonna pop off of that undone stack and then redo back up to the end of my latest, uh, my latest change. 
So that's one example, sort of hypothetical um, tracking of attributes. And you can do this with, with real models also. So here's another example, right? You can clone your model. You can have your model that exists for real, and then you make a new draft version, and then you can transform it in some way that you're not going to save to the server, but that, but that works in a different fashion. So that can be useful for a bunch of, bunch of fun stuff. Um, virtual submodels. Uh, is uh, I, I should figure out a better word for that because that's a little bit too uh, complex. But, uh, but the idea here is that sometimes you have really dense, complex data on the server side in your database, and you can't really expand it into separate resources because it's necessarily very difficult and dense. Um, and you send it over the wire in a very compact format. But then on the client side, you don't have to, you don't, first of all, you don't have to warehouse you know, all of the dense data for every user in your application on the client side. You're only dealing with a small window of it. Um, and then the other thing is that you want a richer way to interact with it. So you can transform this stuff that's not a real, it's not a real table or row on the server into a real model on the client side just so that it's easier to work with. So what I mean by that is, for example, here we've got a list of entities um, in a dense format on the server side. So basically it's saying in this post, there is an entity at character 2 that lasts for 5 characters. There's an entity at character 17 that lasts for 6 characters. 25 that lasts for 6. 41 that lasts for 5. Maybe this is all for like, um, Microsoft, right, is the, uh, is the entity here. And these are all of its locations, all of its occurrences within the, within the text. I don't want to send these down as JSON because it'd be a huge amount of JSON for every entity in the document, right? I want to have this very compact, it's not really binary, but it's this very compact textual format. But then on the client side, and that's what it's in the database too, right? It's basically a blob of text in the database. On the client side, I can bust this out. I can parse it, not really parse it, but parse it. I can split it on the commas. I can map over those strings, split them on the colons, and then make a new model that knows its offset and knows its length. And now on that entity model, I can define all my rich <coughs> features for working with entities, for saying, you know, entity.openlocation or whatever, where it zooms right to that spot in the text where the thing occurs and highlights it for you. Um, and this is, this is a model on the client side that has no corresponding server side um, uh, resource. It's this, it's this tiny piece of a binary field on the server, but it has a real representation as a model on the client. So that's a nice um, pattern. And I think the last one that I've got for you today. Um, so what's going on with, uh, with Backbone uh, roadmap-wise? Um, we tagged a, a 1.0 uh, f about four months ago, and, uh, and we're getting pretty close to being done with a 1.1. I had hoped to have it ready uh, for today, but it is sadly not so. So maybe by the end of the conference, uh, we can uh, huddle together during lunch and uh, crank through the last few things. It's, uh, I think we'll do a 1.1 because there's, there's a few changes, but it's mostly little bug fixes, a couple changes to URL handling to make things slightly prettier um, for some folks who are mounting different backbone apps for each different user. Um, we're also proxying through a few more underscore methods than we did before, both because there have been new methods added to underscore and also because we're going to start to add some of the underscore methods to the model, not just to the collection, for situations where it makes sense where you have a model with a whole bunch of data and you want to be able to do some, some uh, transformations on that data and some aggregations on that data. And, uh, and yeah, so hopefully that'll be done soon. And, uh, and that'll be a 1.1. And I should thank uh, Brad Dunbar, Tim Greaser, Casey Foster, and uh, Phil Frio in particular for doing most of the changes that have happened uh, since 1.0. And uh, that's what I got for you with a few minutes for questions. I think maybe about five minutes. Thanks, guys. Are we going to do mics for the crowd, or should yeah, I yeah. it? Sure. Mics for the crowd. Is 1.1 backwards compatible? Um, mostly. So there's going to be a few uh, slight changes, which is why it's a 1.1 and not a 1.01. 1 um, but they're probably not going to be anything that you're going to run into unless you were the person who opened the ticket that asked for the bug to be fixed. Like, for the thing I talked about with the URLs is basically, if you have, uh, you know you can mount a backbone app at a root URL that's considered the base? Previously, it was putting a slash at the end of the root, and now it will not because it's prettier if you don't. Um, and that will affect you if you've been doing that. But unless you're the guy that opened the ticket, that probably, you probably aren't. So basically, yeah. Anything else? Let's see. We got one back there. Question about the, uh, the, the mediator pattern. So we had internally uh, thought about the global events as a use case for handling two views that need to talk to each other, but in, in without doing it as a way to talk through a model, uh, without using a model to talk through it, because the data that needs to be 
exchange between the two views has nothing to do with what's synchronized on the server. Right. I was curious if you could expand on your, your thoughts about the totally. So that's where you should or shouldn't do that. Yeah. That, so that's one really interesting use case. Is you have you have uh, two views there talking through this global event system um, because there isn't a model that corresponds. Um, but for me, I think if you just have a reference between the views, that's easier than having the views talk through this global system. So it might feel so sometimes with events. Um, People use them more often than they need to because it feels cleaner to have it through an event instead of having a reference to the object and calling a function on it. But in practice, it's not really any different. So an event, an event, what it is, is that all it is is a function that's being called. It's just being called by the other guy. So instead of instead of you calling a particular function on that other view and having a reference to it, you know that global object is having a reference to you and is calling the function on you instead of that other object doing it. So it's it's effectively the same thing. I mean, well, I don't know about effectively. It's a different it's a different style for doing what is basically the same pattern as just having the reference. <coughs> so normally that's what I do. I have those two views that they have to talk both have to talk to each other, both have to send messages to each other. They both have references to each other, and they would just be calling functions on each other as they need to. But a mediator also works. All right. Uh, okay, so let's see. You talked about lazy loading of full models. One of the things we run into a lot is that we have kind of partial models, right? right? So we have we have kind of the small version of the model, the medium version right. of the model, the full version. Have you seen any good patterns for dealing with that? I think we've done that too. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what the pattern was. I mean, part of it is is uh, you check for the data. You say, is the data here? And use the same kind of pattern. You have a, you have a function that that uh, that. Rec that uses a, a dot then to give you the data, and if it exists, it'll come back immediately, and if it doesn't exist, it'll go to the server and fetch it, and then uh, continue on from there. So I think the basic statement pattern applies, um, and probably your model just has um, the model, and it knows what state it's in, right? It's going to know which of the versions it's been initialized with, and then you're going to have a fetch with a parameter that, that lets you load whichever version you're asking for. Um, I think I think you'd want to use uh, well, a string or a, in JavaScript probably the same thing as an enum since they're uh, immutable just to say what the what the type of the uh, of the representation is that's been loaded, and then the cool thing you can do is to not have to care about which one you want to load. The cool thing to do is to then ask just for the data and have the model be smart enough to say, oh, I know which representation that data is, and I'm going to go get that one for you. So you're in your application, then you no longer have to care about about which version might be loaded. All you have to do is ask for the data that you want, and it'll know be smart enough to know what to go get for you. <coughs> Over there, you can just, oh, we got mics. Uh, if you've got a model uh, that has a structure deeper than one level, uh -huh. and you want to listen on changes uh, to that model that you know is deeper than one level, uh, Backbone doesn't really support that, so is the trick to just keep all your models at one level, or? How else would you go about? So the the backbone, um, the easy backbone way to do it. So basically, first of all, there's if you want to do it in that particular way and have nested JSON that goes down several more levels, there are plugins that do that for you and that will send changes uh, through for you. Um, it gets harder to identify what the change is if you're changing the title ele the title property of the first element in an array of the attributes, right? Then you have to have a way of saying what it is that got changed. It becomes a little bit more difficult in that in that work pattern. But there's plugins that can do that if you'd like. Um, the backbone sort of way to do it is to say your server-side database is probably uh, relational. So it is basically flat. You have these scalar values as the attributes on your object. And if it's nested, that's a relation. So instead of having your array of uh, sub-attributes, what you do is you have your model, and your model has a collection of sub-models. And then you have ways to listen to events on whatever piece you want. And if the data is really rich, then that's, then that's one way to go. Um, so that's kind of what I was showing with the with, uh, user has a friends collection of other users. So that's, instead of having this nested JSON, which again gets slightly more procedural of, uh, of uh, I have a change on the fifth friend in my user's arrays uh, name field. Instead of that, I actually have a reference to the object for Emily or whoever it is in that collection. And I can listen to changes on her or on that collection directly. So that's sort of the more backbone way to do it is to have models that have collections of their sub resources inside of them. We're about out of time, so one more if there is one. Otherwise, thanks a lot, folks. <laughs>